everybody. I'm Sabrina, one of the technicians at Robbinsville, location mainly at North Star Betts. Today we're going to talk about triage. So this is one of the really important things that we do um, when it comes to emergency medicine. It all comes down to that triage process. Um, so these are some key factors that you kind of need to keep in mind so that you can do what's best for the pet and try to do what's the right thing. And always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them at the end. So triage, what you need to know. So today we're going to be covering pretty much what does it mean to triage an animal. It also means how do you triage and prioritize, as well as it's an emergency, now what do we do? So there's going to be, of course, you've triaged the pet, but what are you going to do after that? Um, there could be a lot of things. So triaging a pet. Triage comes from the word, the French word, and means select or sort. You want to evaluate the symptoms to determine who gets seen first or who's the most important, who's the most critical. This can definitely be frustrating in the emergency field because owners that have already been waiting are seeing you take their pet to the back and that's when they're going to get upset. And this is when communication is key with our clients in the front office because they need to remember that their pet not being rushed to the back is actually a good thing. The sad part is the patients that are being rushed to the back immediately, they're more critical and those are the kids we need to work on first and foremost. But we always want to communicate with owners that we're not forgetting about you, we're not saying they're more important than your pet, it's just a matter of they're more critical and we want to make sure that we do what's best for all of our emergency patients that come through that door. So, the front desk here at North Star is going to page, can I get a technician to triage A? Enter species animal here. You'll hear dog, cat, rabbit, snake, lots of different things can come over that overhead. So a technician and or assistant are going to go and triage the patient by assessing the patient and communicating with the owners what they're noticing, what's going on. Stat patients are those that are usually presenting with a severe life-threatening crisis of a situation and those are those kids that are going to start getting things moving pretty quickly. Failure to triage appropriately could mean life or death. Not to mean scary, but it could literally mean life or death for the patient. So, priority, how do we determine the level of priority of the patients that are coming through that front door? First, you wanna perform a quick assessment of the patient. So this is gonna start as soon as you walk through the doors and walk up to the front office and start seeing the animal that you're gonna be triaging. You want to take in everything. You haven't talked to the owner, you haven't even touched the pet yet, but you wanna make sure that you're paying close attention because as you walk up to that pet, you're gonna be gaining information that's gonna come in important later on. So, main things, are they actively dying? That's gonna set your feet in motion pretty quickly. Are they in need of immediate medical attention? Can you feel pulses? That's when you start putting your hands on the pet. But these are important things that are gonna start helping you understand the level of priority. Are they actively bleeding? If they're covered in blood, who is it? You should probably get gloves if there's blood involved, because if it's the owner's blood, that can be a problem. We don't wanna play with the human people blood, but you want to make sure you know where the blood's coming from and if it's the human or the animals. And are they immediate danger to other patients? So this could be maybe they're contagious, maybe the animal is fractious, uh, but things to all keep in mind when you walk up and you triage this pet. You want to assess the ABCs of triage. What are the ABCs of triage? Airway, breathing, and circulation. Circulation meaning you want to check the heart rate, the mucous membranes, as well as like their pulses and things that, of that nature. You do wanna listen for any of the heart and lung sounds because that's one of the big things that's gonna dictate which route you take when you're triaging an animal. What is their level of consciousness? Are they bright and alert and jumping? Are they trying to eat you? Are they just laying in their owner's arms? Do they seem like they're not even alive? These are all things that you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind. And like I said, it's gonna kinda of change your steps that you're gonna do next. Big thing is when you do start talking to the owner, if the pet's not obviously actively looking like them to pass away or you're in fear that it's not going to make it, um, you want to keep the history as brief as possible. This is when the owners are going to want to tell you the life story of Fluffy and tell you what he ate three days ago and the fact that he tore a toenail when he was two months old. But what you want to know is what brought you into our hospital today? Why did you come in today? 
When did this happen? Did it happen a few days ago? Has it been a week? Has it been a few hours? This is also going to gauge what you're going to do with the pet. Has anything been done so far? So like, have you been to your regular veterinarian? Have you been to another emergency hospital? Have they done blood work? Have they done x-rays? Have they given medications? These are all things that are going to steer what you're going to do next. Previous medical diagnosis and any changes. This is one of the big questions you want to know because if there's a pet that comes through our doors for the emergency service and they already have an underlying disease process that's going to be important for, for treatment. For example, I've had a pet come through the door that they told me their pet's been vomiting or they've been not wanting to eat. But I said, do you, your pet have any previous medical conditions or surgeries? Oh yeah, he's a diabetic. That's going to start changing what you're going to ask the owner. Um, or do they have any known heart conditions? Do they have any kidney failure? It's important to know what's happened in the past to this pet or if they have a, a diagnosis that's once again going to steer what you do with the animal. Are there any medications and when did they last get them? This is sometimes also a question that's going to help steer you in the way of getting the owner to give you the information you need because sometimes they forget that their pet has a previous medical condition or, or disease process. I have had the situation where an owner said, yep, not any medications, it's doing fine, whatnot. Hour later, comes up to the front desk, how much longer? My dog needs his insulin. Excuse me? Things you kind of need to tell me. So if you're going to ask them if there are any medications, they're going to be like, oh, no, he's, oh, he's on insulin. Another key factor is you want to know, say he's on enalapril or any other types of medications. Things that's going to be important for later on down the line. When I go up to triage an animal, um, I s will start to look at the pet. And I'm also, if the pet looks like it's alert and it's not an immediate issues of possibly passing away or it needs to be rushed to the back, so try to talk to the owner first and get the questions that I need to know and then also putting my hands on the pet um, because that'll also make sure that you're actively listening to the owner and not ignoring them while you put your hands on Fluffy to see what the gums are or are trying to check heart rate and pulses and things of that nature. Um, but obviously you kind of move things along and do everything simultaneously if it looks like the pet is in active crisis. But if you do determine that the pet is unstable, you should ask, do you want your pet resuscitated, or also known as a code status? This is going to let us know that if we should be jumping right on top of everything and getting an IV catheter and doing chest compressions and placing a tube, things we need to know when we get them to the back. Everything when these pets are really sick comes down to seconds. Do we have permission to actually place an IV catheter and have IV access? Um, and do we have permission to give medications? These are all things that are going to, once again, steer us to what we're going to do with those pets when we get them to the back treatment room. So once you actually get your hands on the animal, one of the things is you're going to want to check their, their gums, as in Fluffy's sharp little teeth right there. I think he needs a dental. Um, but you want to flip the look, lip and look at the gums. What is the color of the mucous membranes? This is going to tell you a lot about what's going on with the animal. Are they normal? Are they pale, white, ecteric? ecchymosis, or is there petechia, are they gray, are they muddy, are they brick red, cyanotic, all these different versions of what they could look like can lead to a possible understanding of what's going on inside the body system. What is the capillary, capillary refill time, also known as the CRT? Normal is about one to two seconds. Is it delayed? Um, is it not discernible? Um, these are all things that are also going to start moving your steps a little faster. Um, for example, if there's a pet that comes in that might be dehydrated, maybe they're having a lot of diarrhea, HGE for example, um, there's times where their capillary refill times is going to be delayed. This is one of those kids that you want to get to the back because that means their circulation is not okay. If possible, once you get to the patient to the back, um, if it's a sooner rather than later than getting into an exam room, you do want to make sure you get a weight on the patient as soon as possible because a lot of drug doses and medications that are going to be very immediately administered are going to rely on that weight. It's very, very important to get a TPR or temperature, pulse, and respiratory rate on your patients when you're triaging. So some examples of temperature issues could be hyperthermia versus fever. Do they have a fever? Maybe there's an underlying situation where the patient has an infection of some sort, or are they just really worked up? Those Labradors that have been in the car for 15 to 20 minutes, longer than they should be, or they're just running around the waiting room, is it actually a sickness, or are they just worked up and they need to calm down? Also, you want to worry about those kids that say heat strokes. 
um, those are going to be kids that you're going to be really concerned about the temperature. You also want to think about hypothermia or shock, poor perfusion, things of that nature, but temperatures are very important. Pulses. Are they tachycardic? Are they bradycardic? Um, do they have pulses that match the heartbeat? If they don't match, you've got a situation on your hands that you want to start trying to figure it out sooner rather than later with that doctor. Do they even have peripheral pulses? If you don't feel pulses at all, that's one of the things that's going to kick you in motion to get that animal to the back as soon as possible. That means there's another problem with circulation and there's something that needs to be worked on right away. Respiration. Does the patient have uh, tachypnea, dyspnea, apnea? Um, are there normal breath sounds? If they are not breathing right or appropriately, those are one of those kids you want to get to the back because, once again, things can go downhill very quickly when there's not good circulation or when they're not breathing appropriately. Know your vital ranges. They're going to vary. This is just a rough estimate of normal situations, but when it comes to normal, they're going to vary. So say, for example, you've got a puppy that comes through. They're going to normally have a little bit of a higher heart rate, so you don't necessarily want to be too crazy worried, but if you've got a Great Dane that's got a heart rate of 140, that's something you want to bring into consideration. Um, are they older? That might play a factor. Large breeds versus small breeds. Like I said, that Great Dane with a heart rate of 140 is a problem, but also you've got those little, like, maybe it's a cat and his heart rate is 220. Is it because he's nervous or is it normal? Things you want to bring into consideration. Patient's been assessed. You've talked to the owner. You've put your hands on the pet. You've gotten your vital signs. Now what do we do? So if it's been decided that the patient is high priority or kind of a stat situation or needs to be moved along the line of our triage uh, list, we want to alert a doctor as soon as we possibly can um, and bring the pet to the treatment room to immediately help stabilize or start working on the patient to get them um, to figure out what's going on. While the patient's being worked on, a more complete history should be taken from the owner. This is one of those situations where if there's a stat called, ideally we have two people go up to the front of the waiting room. One person's going to get bring the pet to the back as soon as possible, possibly have a code status if they can, but that second person is going to find out all those questions. What is your pet here for? How long has it been going on? Are there any medications? What signs have you been seeing? Things are going to help us determine what we need to do for that pet in the back. If the patient is not determined to be a stat, then we're going to wait and, see, and let them know that their pet's vitals are within normal li limits. You don't necessarily want to use the word stable. That makes people think that their pets don't need to be seen, they, can, they don't need to be here, and, but their pet can still be really be sick, even if their vitals are in within normal limits. Um, but we want to let the owners know that if they notice anything changing, they can let us know and we may need to re-triage again because sometimes these days emergency wait times can be ex long, longer than we'd like, but things can change very quickly up in the waiting room and we want to make sure that they know that they can let somebody know, hey, my dog's breathing has gotten worse or he's been vomiting four times while I've been in the waiting room, things like that. Just let them know that they don't need to just sit there and be quiet. If there's any changes, let us know. Things can change quite quickly. So emergency levels. This is something that we've kind of had to touch base on with the world of COVID that's kind of everyone in, went out and got a pet and all the primary care veterinarians have kind of been overwhelmed and we're trying to figure out what needs to be seen now, what can have an appointment, or things we can kind of wait and see what happens. So true emergencies are things that need to be seen immediately, right now, don't wait. Things like respiratory distress, collapsing, unable to walk or get up, um, any cat or dog with um, inability to urinate or straining to urinate, if they're actively seizing, um, severe trauma like hit by cars, dog fights, um, any profuse bleeding from the wound, uh, non-protective retching, we'll get to what that could be later on. Um, we could also move on to urgent, which is time sensitive. So persistent or severe vomiting, anorexia for more than 24 hours, uh, foreign body ingestion, um, which is kind of increasing their outward signs of sickness. Aggressive coughing, post-labor complications, uh, if a patient's been having multiple seizures in 24 hours, any vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, toxin ingestion, heart issues, things of that nature. Semi-urgent emergencies. Vomiting, maybe he vomited twice within a short, um, short amount of time but seems to be acting okay. Diarrhea, 
straining to defecate, foreign body ingestion with no signs of illness. Maybe it's a chronic foreign body. Maybe it's a gastric foreign body and we don't need, it's not showing a very sick pet just yet. Any dog or cat that's having trouble urinating or uh, bloody urine, small wounds and lacerations, and then the non-productive cough with decently normal breathing, broken toenails, eye discharge, swelling, limping, mild trauma. Then you have the non-urgent ones, which could be seen on an appointment, like quick care, or it's okay to wait till you have your primary care veterinarian when they have an opening. Itching, scratching, chronic weight loss, chronic illness with no recent changes, hair loss, red eyes, skins, ears, um, and if a single seizure with full recovery, especially if they have a known history of seizures. Um, usually when they call us, we'll kind of let them know, it's okay, it's okay, but if they continue to have them, that's a different conversation to be had. How to recognize and handle specific emergencies. The most common emergencies that come through our door and any other ER or even GP's doors these days. So urinary obstructions, difficulty breathing, toxins, ingestions, hit by cars, foreign bodies, hypoglycemia, seizures, allergic reactions, GDV, hemoabdomens, cardiac emergencies, and those fun exotic patients that we play with. Urinary obstructions. Of course, there's a kitty cat in the litter pan. So, some of the symptoms that we're gonna look into are straining to urinate. If they're frequently trying to urinate in the pan but not really producing a lot. Um, vocalizing, they're really loud, they're crying a lot, they're trying to get your attention. Inappropriate urination, those kids that kind of go and urinate in front of you in the kitchen. Like, hey look, something's wrong. Vomiting, lethargy. Also, if an owner states that their pet has been having vomiting or diarrhea or lethargy, especially if it's a male cat and they cannot tell you the last time that cat urinated, you just wanna ask if you can go ahead and bring them to the back and check on them. For example, I had a cat come through our emergency that the owner said, oh, he's just been kind of laying there in the middle of the hallway. He hasn't been moving around much, has no interest in food. I said, do you know the last time he urinated? No, I don't. Do you mind if I bring your pet to the back? Sure. I asked if we can place an IV catheter or give pain medications if need be. I also asked that question. If something were to happen, do you want your pet to be resuscitated? All those things we talked about a little while ago. They said yes. I brought their cat to the back. Their cat was severely blocked. Their cat was also extremely critical and he needed immediate anesthesia to be unblocked. So they may not tell you that they've been having these certain symptoms, but a hint is if a male cat comes in and they can't tell you the last time it urinated and it's having vomiting and issues like that, just bring it to the back. Have it checked. So what do you want to do? Palpate the bladder. If it's large or firm, it could be an obstruction. So you want to make sure you alert a doctor ASAP. Don't squeeze hard. Don't keep trying to palpate it and do anything of that nature because if dogs or cats that come through when they are actively blocked or obstructed, that bladder can pop and you have a whole new problem on your hands. So if you notice it's large and firm and they don't immediately seem like they want to do any type of urination, just stop and alert a doctor. Difficulty breathing, dyspnea. Symptoms, increased respiratory effort, pale or cyanotic gums, large amounts of upper airway noise, um, and then cats will kind of open mouth breathing, kind of panting. Painting for a cat can be worrisome. Make sure you keep an eye on that. What do you want to do? Have someone step in O2 cage in, in our ICU or wherever ICU you may have. Also, once you bring to the pet, you want to make sure there's flow-by available until you can get it into an O2 cage. You also, before you want to bring it back, try to get permission for an IV catheter and meds. Please remember that sometimes you may need to give medications to these pets before you try to place an IV catheter. The more you stress it, the worse things can get, and sometimes you just need to give it some time to cool off and give it some meds. Very important to ask an owner if this is okay. You do wanna to try to use flow by oxygen while placing catheters and getting vitals and giving medications. Um, ideally, you wanna check SpO2, but if it's stressing the patient out, making things worse, stop. Sometimes the doctor doesn't think it's actually necessary, so you also wanna ask your doctor who's helping you get a feel of what's going on with the pet. And if the pet's airway is obstructed, it may need to be intubated and sedated, sedated and intubated. Um, or as we say, take its airway. We've got some technicians here that love to do that. Toxin ingestion. So lots of different types of toxins, but so some symptoms can be um, depending on what has been ingested. Things like chocolate, you might notice some agitation, tachycardia, GI upset. Marijuana, it's common these days. Stumbling, dribbling urine, hyperreactive, crossing feet, shaking. They just look out of it. 
What to do? You want to find out exactly what the pet ate and if they have an idea of how much and definitely when. Because if they tell you that this pet got into the Easter basket eight hours ago, you're not really going to do vomiting because it's already starting to be digested. Or if they can tell you that it happened 30 minutes ago. Um, or, hey, they got into my grandmother's medication bin. How long ago? Do you know what meds it got into? These are all going to start steering what direction you're going to go because sometimes you want to induce vomiting, but there are certain times we're not going to induce vomiting. Um, some examples of those are going to be rapidly absorbable uh, toxins um, like ethylene glycol, um, LSD, cocaine. That has happened. Also, you don't want to make them vomit if there's any type of caustic type of toxin like uh, bleach or any type of like harsh chemicals like that. So you always want to ask the doctor if it's okay to induce vomiting, but more important, again, what do they eat and when? And you're also gonna have the owner probably call poison control, which there will be a charge for it. And the wait time will be probably a little bit longer. So you wanna make sure that they kind of get in on that because that's gonna help us later on when we can start treating the pet. But you definitely wanna to try to figure out what it ate and when, those are the most important things. Remind the owner, we don't wanna get them in trouble. We don't care what your dog ate. Just let us know it's for the best interest of the pet. Hit by car. A lot of these start to happen once it starts getting nice outside, but symptoms can be lacerations, cardiac arrest, abnormal mentation, lameness. This is all going to depend also where the animal got struck. Sometimes they're going to tell you that they know that their pet got hit by a car. You can also ask questions like, do you know like where he got hit? Because sometimes, oh, he just got hit in the hip area or he got ran over. Sometimes they can't tell you if it got hit. My dog got loose and we found him laying on the side of the road. Things like that you might notice is you might notice some scraped up body areas, um, scuffed nails, they might be abnormal mentation, things like that. So you, they're not always going to come up and say, oh, he got hit by a car. But these are the type of symptoms that you might notice that the patient's presenting with to let you know that they might lead you down that road of it got hit by a car or a vehicle of some sort. What do you want to do? You want to get permission for an IV catheter. Um, some pain medications and possibly some radiographs because some of these patients that have come through and got hit by a car, they might have, you could feel as something is just not, there's a leg that's kind of dangling or say they're not using their hind limbs. The doctor might want to do x-rays pretty quickly because um, sometimes there's spinal injuries. Um, they could just be um, respiratory situations like they might show contusions if they have airway issues, but it's all going to depend on the severity of the injury, injuries. Treatments are all going to vary. Foreign body ingestion. Is it a lab or a doodle? Start there. But if they've been vomiting, anorexia, history of eating foreign material, one of the big things is does your pet have a common likelihood of eating things you're not supposed to? Sometimes it's like, yep, he eats socks all the time, but he usually passes it. Or, yeah, my one sock has been missing and I don't know where it's at. I think the dryer ate it. These are some of the symptoms you kind of might notice with the vomiting, the anorexia, abdominal pain, sometimes distension. But you want to get permission for an IV catheter and some medications and possibly some x-rays because this is going to help the doctor kind of figure out what they're going to be doing with their plan. Um, but these kids can also get sick pretty quickly or show up pretty sick. Like what if they're septic? If they have like a perforation, um, these kids may come in like a Labrador that's wagging his tail. He might be happy as can be. Or you're going to have that doodle that comes in flat out because he's had an an obstruction that's maybe perforated and he's sick as a dog and they're all going to show up in different ways but you're going to notice that when you walk up to that pet and see what's going on. Hypoglycemia. Some of the symptoms are going to be lethargy, dull, unresponsive, mentally inappropriate, ataxia, there might be some twitching, some tremors, um, and some weakness. What do you do if you think that the pet might be hypoglycemic? Once again, Ask for permission for an IV catheter, um, as well as a blood glucose level, and to possibly give you medications. Because if you get that pet to the back and the BJ is low, there's a good chance you want to get an IV catheter in pretty quickly and administer dextrose. Seizuring pets. Things you might notice are, they could look like that, or <laughs> episodes of falling over, paddling, tremoring, unresponsive, um, urinating and defecating on themselves. If an owner does come through the door and they says, I think my pet had a seizure, I will ask them, can you describe it to me? Sometimes they'll show you a video. Everybody's got cameras these days and they're happy to take videos and pictures of what's going on with their pet. It's really help, helpful when this happens, um, but sometimes you can kind of distinguish 
if it's more of a seizure or maybe they have a vestibular episode, but any types of possible seizure pets that come through the door, you want to ask the owner if they have a history of seizures. Because if they do have a history of seizures, maybe you want to ask what medications they're on, how often they've been seizing, and also when their last seizure was. If it's the first seizure ever, some, you do want to ask them if possibly they're induced to a toxin, a medication they were supposed to get into, and then how long did it last and when did it happen. Sometimes also long acting seizures can definitely cause some severe mental inappropriateness as well as their temperature can rise. Another reason why it's very important to get temperatures on these kids and TPRs on anything that comes through that door. But you wanna make sure you get permission for an IV catheter and if we can give medications if need be, like if it's seizing, you wanna make sure you have a dose from the doctor readily available in case they do have a seizure so you can get administer medications. Allergic reactions. That's hives. <laughs> Like that, hives, red skin or eyes, eye discharge, facial swelling, scratching, dyspnea, as well as vomiting. These kids can also present in a way of as allergic reactions as well as anaphylaxis. And they might not be outwardly showing you that they've got hives or red or itchy skin. They have internal responsive to a anaphylaxis response, so it's important to know if they have any of those symptoms. But once again, you want to ask for permission for an IV catheter to see if you can give some medications. As well as if there's facial swelling, you possibly want to monitor for any trouble breathing, i.e. the brachycephalic breeds. Those bulldogs, those French bulldogs that come in because they're running around outside and they got stung by a bee, they come in, they're covered in hives. More often than that, those kids are the ones that are going to have swelling in their airway and it's going to be trouble breathing. Definitely monitor for that respiratory rate and effort. And consider measuring SpO2 if the doctor thinks it's indicated. Bloat and GDV, one of those big ones that come through our front door. Those magical words that we tell everybody, don't say those words. You're gonna possibly notice some restlessness, pacing, unproductive retching. That's one of the biggest things if someone comes in this front door and says, my Labrador or my Great Dane's been trying to vomit but nothing comes up. That should set off alarms in your head immediately. They may be drooling or vomiting, have some clopping, collapsing episodes as well as a lot of deep-chested dog breeds have this happen to them. It can be small breeds, not just the big ones. Don't be fooled. But if something like this comes to the front door, this is one of those stat situations that the front desk is going to call as a stat if they mention those magical words. Once again, get permission for an IV catheter and some medications as well as radiographs because one of the first things that they're going to ask you to do is possibly get a right lateral on your patient so they can see what that stomach is doing. Hemoabdomen. Is it a Labrador? Sorry. Things you might notice, descended abdomen, pale mucous membranes, weakness, collapsing episodes, hypotensive, weak pulses, they might have some bruising, as well as some respiratory distress because if there's a lot of fluid going on there, it's going to press on things that are going to cause them to be uncomfortable, start pressing on vessels and constricting things. You want, once again, permission for the catheter and medications. Bring the patient back to treatment and the doctor is most likely going to scan the abdominal area and sometimes you want to make sure that you do have anything set up for abdominal synthesis or at least for them to get a sample of what's going on in that abdomen and it's probably a good idea to use O2 because circulation is not going to be proper in this patient so you want to help the blood flow with the oxygen. Cardiac emergencies that come through our doors. Some of the symptoms that we will see are pale mucous membranes, cold extremities, hypertension, tachycardia, collapsing, lethargy. They may have dull heart sounds as well as an increased respiratory rate. Just for an example, today we had a nine-year-old Great Dane come through our door and the woman just said he's been vomiting and he had a collapsing episode. We get the dog to the back, all 200 pounds of him, and we started assessing the pet with the temperature, pulses, checking his gums. The doctor started scanning, and we saw, found a very serious heart condition that this pet was having. So it's not just going to be a right in front of your face. It could be a hidden problem. But you want to make sure you get permission for an IV catheter, any medications the pet may be on. If they have cardiac history, also car code status, but you want to make sure you get that on most patients. But Bring the patient to the treatment area. They're probably going to ask you to set up an EKG just so they can see what that heart is doing to see if there's any arrhythmias or blocks or things of that nature. Their respiratory rate may be off, so you want to make sure you have some O's available 
and also possibly have chest tapping supplies available because there's those kids that come through that say have pericardial effusion. I have seen a boxer that literally right in front of us started to pass, heart stopped, doctor very quickly, stuck a needle and drained the blood from the pericardial and that dog popped up and we were able to treat it and bring it back and he did go home eventually. But you just wanna have everything available and things with cardiac patients can go downhill very quickly as well as a lot of our other sickness kids that come in, but the heart ones are scary. So here in this hospital, we do a lot of exotic patients. We see the birds, we see the reptiles, we see the small mammals, the pocket pets. There's varying things you should ideally know when it comes to these kids. But for example, weight and TPRs are on small mammals. Triage are very important. For us, we bring back all the small mammals like the rabbits and the guinea pigs and the ferrets and we do a TPR on them. And if you go into the exotics department and ask for normal vital ranges, you're gonna start a fight. So I'm only gonna give you the basics on them because like small mammals like the rabbits and the guinea pigs, you ideally want them to be about 100.5 to 103.5, but those chinchillas are actually more of a 97 to 100, so don't be alarmed when you notice that. But if they've got a low temp, you wanna make sure you do supply heat if needed. You want to keep an eye out if there's any distended abdomen. Definitely alert the doctor about that because a lot of these like rabbits and these guinea pigs that come through, they can have GI stasis. They can also have some dangerous things when organs start flipping around where they're not supposed to be. Trouble breathing, you want to make sure you've got O's available and you ideally probably take them to the exotics area or ICU and that's where you're going to have a doctor do their full assessment. But once again, make sure you ask for IV catheter access pain meds, possibly radiographs on the small mammals. Those are going to be important when you're talking to the owner. The birds. So if you notice anything like they're fluffed, bleeding of any type, because they don't have much blood in their body, so any type of blood loss can be pretty scary and dangerous. Any head or tail bopping. Bobbing, my apologies. Sitting at the bottom of the cage, dull, not really responsive. Any type of neurologic behavior. It may not be a seizure, but they could just be having any type of neurologic behavior, you want to bring them to the back. These kids like to have toxins from things that are just in their environment and they can get sick pretty quickly. As well as those reptiles that come through the building are, get, are snakes that come through. We've got the, the bearded dragons, the chameleons, all those guys. Big thing is you want to make sure they're warm because normally they have a nice toasty place in their home. So it's ideally you want to put them on a heating source because especially in our waiting room in the winter, it's just too cold for these guys. So I do ask if they can come to the back and if we can place them into a heating area just to keep them more comfortable. And a big key factor for reptiles is you don't want to place them in an O2 cage because it actually can, long story short, it can actually make them stop breathing. So don't put them in an O2 cage. But that's the main things that are going to be coming through our front door here and most animal hospitals these days. But the main things you need to remember are you want to assess the patient's level of priority and act accordingly. If it's a stat emergency, you need to ask for a CPR code if they want resuscitation. Permission for IV catheters and medications. You want to get a brief but a very prevalent history. Focus on what's important to the situation. I don't care what happened to Fluffy when he was two months old and he tore a toenail. We need to know what's going on right now. And TPRs are very important. Know your vital ranges because that's going to steer you in the direction you need to go. It's also better to treat something as a serious emergency if it's not. So if you have any questions, concerns, just bring the pet to the back. Get them assessed by a doctor. It's rather to be safe than sorry because this is life or death. And also, if you're a North Star employee when you are triaging pets, you want to make sure that you sign off on that clipboard that's at the front desk and place a name tag. It's very important to make sure that everybody's identified because lots of bad things can happen. And even if it's trying to eat you, have the owner put it on. But any questions?